Welcome to Season 3 of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. <clears throat> he's charismatic, he's interesting, creative, and inspiring, and he's from my maternal homeland. John Morris is a painter and mental health mentor who hails from Scotland. He hosts the Mind, Body, and Soul show for the Los Angeles Tribune and speaks about art, self-discovery, growth, and yes, even wrestling. <laughs> Morris is inside the Cinematic Mind series is worth seeing on YouTube, where he dives deep into the personal psyche of a movie character. Please welcome John Morris. Thank you very much, Debbie. I really appreciate it. It's super cool to be here. It is my maternal homeland. I've never been there. And for others who have not been in Scotland, you describe... Well, for me, I moved here. I must have been about 21. I actually moved here for different positions with work and everything. But I grew up in a place called Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, which is in the centre of England. And when you first see it, especially on the West Coast, and it, it's beautiful summer and everything's warm and it's all happy, it's, it's changed a lot now. But it was really breathtaking to see clean beaches, beautiful waters, you know, everything. It is quite remarkable. The people, again, like anything, it can be an acquired taste for sure. You know, it, it just depends what circles you move in and what kind of things you do. Yeah, yeah. And for those of us on the outside looking in, you do see the scenes. You do see the, the scenes in the pubs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's literally world famous, you know, of course, you've got Turnberry Golf Course, you've got Troon Golf Course, you've got Scotland is famous for golf, it's famous for whiskey, it's famous for a lot of things. It, it's definitely an interesting place, depending on your personality to, to live. What was, tell me about your family, what were they like? So my father went through a number of different jobs and professions and eventually ended up in the civil service and worked there for, I think it's close to like 21 years now. My mother uh, was, how, how do I describe this? She did work little bits and pieces here. She was really, you know, a stay at home mom that stayed at home long after I left. It was, it was one of the things, both had their own issues that were going on, and life could be quite difficult being there. It's, certainly as an only child, you didn't, or I certainly didn't mix all that well with other people for one reason or another. So again, when you make a big move, like moving from Huddersfield to Scotland, and you're trying this on your own for the first time, it took a long time, even still now, to really adapt into society and now in the role that I'm in where I basically just don't see anybody for sometimes months on end, it works for me. I'm not a housebound, but I'm probably housebound by choice just because my work here is everything and whatnot. It was that big shift for sure. And it would be like <clears throat> some of us moving over to Newfoundland where, yeah. yes, they speak English, but you can't understand a word they're saying. <laughs> That's kind of like the East Coast. Not only do they speak what we call broad Scottish, broad Scots, but they speak it at a at a, at a decibel and a speed that yeah. is almost incomprehensible. And, and, and it mixed with a slang that yeah. is like regional. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And, and again, there's, there's a place called Bowness way on the East Coast. And then if you go up into Peterhead as well, and it literally is, you know, I, I mean, you feel stupid because you're asking almost, can you say this slowly? Can you say this, you know, can, can you translate for me? And people will take serious offense because to them yeah. it's completely normal. But to me, it's like an immigrant that's just come over. It's like, what, what is this? It, it's definitely a, a, a big culture shock. It's mocked a little bit in the movies, but it is the truth. On TikTok, there is one guy in particular, Harbor Custom, I think is his tagline. 
and he's from Newfoundland and he gets people ask him questions and he answers in his very strong <laughs> Newfoundland accent. And you literally, he, I don't even think the captions can pick it up. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can have that for sure. So what was your own self-esteem like when you were growing up? Very mixed. My dad worked away a lot, so didn't really get to see him a lot. My mom, you know, she tried her best, but it was apparent to me later on, and you find this, certainly studying psychology, that from the ages of about three to five, you are going to bring, basically you are preparing yourself for the future there in terms of your education, in terms of your absorption and everything else. So with a mother who really struggled to read, really struggled education-wise, academically, and and a lot of ways to function, I picked up a lot of really bad habits that, again, had knock-on effects later on. I don't mean to, to speak ill of anybody, but, you know, from a psychological perspective, she could be a master manipulator as well. And a lot of people are when, so again, you this is all you've ever known. And this is what I try to talk about. A lot of the time when when we're talking to different opposing groups and they just want to fight each other, whether it's, you know, various gender identity communities versus whoever. And it's reminding them that, look, to them and to you, this is your identity of normal. This is your idea of normal. So to me, you know, it, it was everything's nice. Everything's lovely. La, 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 la you get out into the real world and you recognize that things really aren't. My wife and I, that's been something that I've really had to work through over the years on how people could be such a way and they could behave in such a way that wasn't positive, even in professional environments. I think a lot of that was to do with your upbringing. You find that if you've got brothers and sisters, and I have heard this a lot, that you kind of get used to having a thicker skin. You kind of get used to, you know, the the ruffle and tussle and everything else. Whereas when you just go to school and then you come home, you don't have friends over, you don't see people, you don't really hang out. It socially can be really disastrous. Mm -hmm. And it did. I mean, it took me a while to really get past a lot of that. And I think that's that's good because it was like a big paradox, because on the one hand, you don't enjoy your own company, certainly when I first moved to Scotland and you buy yourself and everything. But on the other hand, you really struggle being around other people. So mm-hmm. it's always that complete pulling apart of it's like soul and spirit separation. It, it's really, really difficult to integrate yourself into anything that has, you know, any depth to it, really. That's really interesting. And that actually, as a component, like when you move from your hometown to another, to a strange place where you don't know everybody or anybody and you can make friends, but Mm -hmm. the adjustment is interesting. And then of course, as much as you wanted to move, you do get a little homesick sometimes, but I guess it all depends on the circumstances, But, but you're right. The toxic family culture that some of us had that we thought was normal and we actually laugh about it other people are looking like yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. well that was i mean contrasting styles because my wife's family is really close and really you know connected and everything whereas mine really isn't so to me having a mother and you know mother-in-law that wanted to see me a lot of the time i was like this is this is weird this is alien to me um <laughs> people giving me hugs that was alien to me but I've said this to my wife before I was like I don't think I've ever been hugged by my father and I don't think I think the last time I was hugged by my mother prior to when we've seen them recently I was probably about eight or nine years old so there's 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 that whole thing that's going on but again everything I, I firmly believe everything's divine it had to happen in a certain way for me to do what I'm doing now and to be able to understand it So what got you into psychology and philosophy? What was it about those two subjects that drew you? So I had gone through quite a an experience. I was a youth minister for about 15 years. I'd gone through quite a lot of experiences after I I, I left there. And there was a lot of political stuff that went on. And basically was very bitter about it, was really steaming out of control just in my own self and was not Again, going back to what we said, I did not know how to deal with anger and bitterness and that disappointment very well. And so literally, 
I was basically drinking myself stupid. You know, there, there was a lot of stuff going on. And then it was 2021 of January 2021 that for no reason at all, I'm sitting in the downstairs office. I put on YouTube on my phone and Wayne Dyer's Everyday Wisdom just mm -hmm. came on. And within two hours, all of the bitterness, all the anger, all the stuff that was there was gone. From there, I listened to his Everyday Wisdom every single day. And that's really where it stemmed from, because he mentioned that he was doing psychology, he was a doctorate in psychology, and I thought, well, I really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy all these different areas, and I was getting my life together. And that was a super cool thing about it, was I logged onto YouTube, I think I googled places to do a psychology degree, and the University of Yale came up, and they had, it was just as, I think we were actually in lockdown, or going into lockdown at that point. I think it was Paul Bloss, who was the, the lecturer at University at Yale in the United States, and he had delivered a full first year worth of teaching on YouTube. So I sat and I watched the entire thing, and I'm taking copious amounts of notes and everything. This is brilliant. Let's see what else is out there. So then I found the first year university degree with MIT, which if you know that you're American universities yeah. and schools and things, you know, oh, is yes. one of the most prestigious. So there's two of the most prestigious uh, universities actually in, in the world right there. And it was John, I forget his surname, but anyway, he basically, you know, he's a very charismatic guy, but it was a whistle stop tour through the brain and, you know, doing all something like in immense detail. From there, I started studying with Stanford, and then I went back to Yale, and I studied psychology there. And again, all this stuff's online, and I'm thinking, great, you've got nearly 100 hours worth of, of study and, and research and everything that's gone on in a year, plus you've listened to 763 books within a year. So now you need something on paper that says you can do this here in the UK. So the Open University, because it needed to fit in with my time, with my schedule and everything right. else, Isn't and I didn't want <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I didn't want to travel or anything. So I was like, this is ideal. And that's what I did. So now I'm going into my third year of doing this and, mm -hmm. you know, literally just develop. And again, it's basically just for that stamp on your book and for that thing. But ultimately, it's the education and what you do with it to, to help many others. So that's really what got me interested in psychology. It was like, I'm very good at reading people. I'm very good at, you know, seeing the things that people don't want me to see, basically. And that has helped in all of these things because people nowadays, I, I think, unfortunately, too many people and too many therapists, coaches, et cetera, et cetera, they keep their clients in therapy for far too long. Like if you've been in therapy for 10 years, there's something wrong with your therapist. <laughs> the whole thing is, I think it's a bigger thing with the therapist because it's also, yeah. it's like the donkey in the stick or, or the donkey in the carrot. It's literally like, okay, if you're paying, you know, 50, 60 pounds a, an hour, mm -hmm. I'll dangle a carrot in front of you and, and keep you walking. Whereas with me, usually within 20 minutes, I'm able to see specifically what the issue is, get to the root of the problem. And then with the extra 40 minutes, we talk about it and, and basically, you know, get you from where you are to where you want to be. Because I think any more than that, there's something not quite right. So that's, in a nutshell, I suppose, really where I found myself going. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for mentioning the the online um, options because, yeah. oh my God, like it is ridiculous how expensive universities mm. are. Now, when I was graduating high school, there was no option to go to college or university because yeah. there was just no money. And that yeah. is back in the 70s. But today, you would literally have to be rich to go to college or get a think, scholarship or be a good football player. I but, think if you want to learn how, or if you want to know how to make money, study it online, study it on YouTube. Yeah. There's enough stuff out there. If you want to become a doctor or an architect or a astrophysicist or whatever, then that's when I would suggest going to university. Yeah. But now I think there are so many more options out there for good jobs and for making a good amount of money and a fortune and everything. Without well, you're never going to make that money back ever. It doesn't matter what your degree is. Yeah. Even in, as a doctor, which they have to yeah. go 10 years. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so hard to make that money back. Yeah. I mean, in the US, and in Canada, it's, it's insane the amount of money that you guys spend. Scotland, we get our tuition paid for us. But in the UK, oh, sorry, in England, I know that it can be in excess of about 25,000 pounds, sort of about 75,000 Canadian dollars. You know, oh, it, it's all. Whereas, obviously, for some of you guys, it's you way know, more for, over here. Yeah, I think for yeah, some yeah. Of the courses. 
Yeah, no, I know. Absolutely. And you do not need it for marketing and PR. No. That's no. that's not a technical skill or physical skill. It's something, if you don't know how to work with people or how to manage people yeah. or, or be a human being, yeah. then you're not made for marketing and PR. But that's one of the biggest problems now, certainly with social media, people have forgotten how to communicate, how to do, how to talk, how to engage, how to build genuine relationships with one another. And I don't mean that obviously blanket for everybody, but that yeah. is for a lot of people. And the secret really to being successful in anything, whether it's art, music, books, whatever, is you have to know marketing, you have to know selling, and you have to know how to build genuine relationships with people so you don't need to do the middle option because it will sell itself. Well, the problem with social media, too, is that some of the bad actors have taken over and, and people have kind of got sucked into that. But on the other hand, they don't really understand what social media is when they get on. Social media isn't anything other different than what we're doing right yeah. now. It's people are at the other, unless it's a bot, but there are people at the other end of a profile. Yeah. So if the person is talking trash in their feed and you don't like what they're saying, follow better people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's simple. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is, is now social media. I saw someone talking about this the other day and by its design, either intentionally or inadvertently, social media thrives on negativity because the more negative comments that you can have means the more engagement that you're having yeah. on somebody's profile, the more the content's going to be pushed out rather than, oh, this is a peaceful thing. Oh, wonderful. Thumbs up, move on. That's the difference, really, what's going on and what's happening. And like you rightly said, there are a lot of people up there at the, at the top that are really thriving on making other people feel miserable. Yeah, and it, and it comes down to personal responsibility after a while, just like everything else, like psychology and philosophy, where you are in charge of your own. I mean, you can't blame being drunk on hitting that person with your car. Yes, you were drunk and you hit that person with a car, but you were drunk. You shouldn't have been behind the wheel in the yeah. first place. Yeah. So it, it's personal response. You can't blame the bartender. I don't know about this over where you are but in north america here there has been a lot of discussion about blaming the bartender and, and actually charging him for not taking the keys when he noticed uh -huh. well have you ever been in a bar yeah. like do you see how many people are in a bar you can't keep track of no. every patron so <laughs> it's like trying to take the personal responsibility away from someone but anyway i digress but I'm really interested to know more about your working as a youth worker. What type of kids did you work with and what did you learn from that experience? So it's probably better to ask what kind of kids I didn't work with. Um, <laughs> so in 15 years, I worked as a youth worker in England. I worked as a youth worker in Scotland and a little bit in America when I was over there. Uh, and it was, it was very, very diverse. So initially it was uh, kids that would come in you know, sort of from the streets and, and they had, you knew they had difficult backgrounds. It exposed me to that a little bit in my home church. And then I had the opportunity to move up to Scotland, as I say, to become a, um, a youth worker here. And initially it was like, okay, well, you know, you're going to be more going into schools here and, and it's, you know, most of the kids are nice and they're friendly and everything. And then you go and do, you know, you, you church youth group and they're mostly church kids. Now, what the church didn't seem to get was that you have a certain demographic that's a certain age, and then you have a massive split. So in terms of the age groups, so you had young kids that were too young for the main youth group, and then some kids that were too old for the, for the actual youth group itself. So it was like it was working in all those different things. And then when the kids eventually moved off sort of three years before I left, it, it was street kids, basically kids that were coming off the streets from broken homes again, which that's more my background in, in working with these boys and girls. But they came this time with, it's around the time that the gender identity push was coming out, the LGBTQI community was becoming more of a, a big central thing. And I really felt a major shift just in the personalities as well of what was going on. I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot of not only acceptance, but how accepting they can be. Because what I found was people of, of my own age group, and my wife found this as well, which is really interesting, that 
certainly within the church, they want to be, it's all about the ego. It's for a lot of them. It's why don't you become this? Why don't you become that? Well, I do this and I do that. And you shouldn't need to fight to find a place really within an organization. And equally, when you are going somewhere to heal, you shouldn't feel forced into, we're going to push you off the cliff, basically, in, in doing this. We eventually left. I built my own art school as an entrepreneur, I suppose. And I taught children, I taught adults. Again, it was basically waves and strafes from everywhere is <laughs> the best way to describe it. And there were some really great kids. I, I had so many really good experiences and memories. I think more than anything, it was how accepting of me they were. It's that whole thing of, you know, you find friends. And it's a very bizarre thing when you've got friends that are essential. And I still keep in touch with some of them now, but friends that are 14 years younger than you. Even this past week, there was one that reached out and, and we reconnected, which was super, super cool to have that. So with younger folks and with older folks, I tend to be very easy to build relationships and friends with. It's more, I think, our own age group. I, and I don't know what it is, you know. So I, just, I was just like, ah, okay. I'm, I'm, I just don't have the energy that I'm going to assign to this, really. Uh, but a lot of really great experiences with them. I get that. The How much of it do you think is about being seen and heard? Because those kids come from broken homes and tough situations. And even the older people you mentioned, Western culture seems to discard and native culture and other cultures, Asian culture, they revere their, their elders and they thrive in their wisdom. But yes. in Western culture, we just here go to home. <laughs> and, and I don't get and in the yeah. and then the kids, if they don't behave at home, and God forbid if they're LGBTQ two spirit, they kick them out of the home. So to answer that, I really found that when kids, as you, as you rightly said, kids that are coming from broken homes, the one thing I think that they want more than anything is a stability. I think be someone who's actually going to listen to them and genuinely wants to listen. And that's the secret to a lot of things is if you can genuinely listen to someone and they can feel that they're being listened to regardless of what it is without political agenda being pushed on them. It, it's amazing. Like you rightly said, within terms of the older folks that are in 60s, 70s, 80s, I think they loved me and I love them because again, I would learn so much and so many different stories from them. And there's so much wisdom there. They are the wisdom of society, and I think they should be listened to and really absorb what they've got. It's taken some of these guys and girls 90 years to learn what they've learned. You know, the stuff that they could save us from, the stuff that they could protect us from, if people are willing to listen, is incredible. Plus, you miss out on so much if you're not willing to. But one thing that they loved always talking with me was they could talk about Alan Watts. They could talk about Florence Govelshin. They could talk about stuff from the past because I had such a varied interest. And I found that I was like, oh my goodness, I found my tribes. Because you can talk to the kids about this and make it cool. You can talk yeah. to the adults about this and be like, wow, you know, it's that middle ground where they're so busy trying to get their own ideas and their own ego in there and their own stamp on the world. And it's like, if you were to look back from, from the world as God sees it, you'd be like, you're not that significant. Let me tell you this. You are not that significant. I don't care who you are uh, and how significant you think you are. You're not. Just try and live 150 years and, and I'll prove my point. It's not that significant. Anything that you do. So when you realize that and you can have fun with the kids, you can be the wise person that's there that's able to speak all of these different things based on your understanding. And you can also be the, the person that's going to play dodgeball with them or football with them or take them on adventures. That's a really cool kind of person to, to have around. And that's really, for me, where I last felt that big acceptance, certainly from the teenagers and stuff that I work with. And that was so cool. There is part of me that misses that equally not enough that I would go back into that line of yeah. work because it's just become far too political now. Not to say that what you're doing now can't be emotionally <laughs> I'm, I'm safe for being at home kids though. Can be, especially with the traumas and, and the issues that they have going today. Yeah. It's, yes. it's even compounded more than it was 20 years yeah. ago. Um, but working with people and helping them through tough emotions, you know, it's what you do and, and it has to put a strain on you sometimes. So is painting your release 
So painting really is, again, it, it was another way for me to, I suppose, find a really good living. <laughs> this is the honest truth. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, painting's my release. I would say probably nowadays writing and, and certainly my books are more my release now. Um, but having said that, I find that as long as you remember to center yourself and not to take on all the emotional stuff that someone's throwing at you, you can actually guide people fairly well. And I think once you take the emotion out of it, and I think this is what I see a lot of therapists doing incorrectly, they become too emotional, which then clouds their judgment. And then they become afraid to tell the client or whatever, whoever it is that they're working with, the truth as they see it. And sometimes it's as blatantly obvious as you are the problem. And it's fine. When you know that you're the problem, you can also then do something, change it. But the, there can be times, certainly with stuff that people share, that you've got to be very, very careful as to how far you're willing to let someone go down the rabbit warren. And when you can spot where they're going and saying, look, you can tell me what happened yesterday. How are you feeling today? I want to know how you're feeling right now in this moment, because you can... Again, what happens a lot of times is that people will resurface ghosts of the past over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there are groups out there that will help you do this. But the problem is you never make any progress. So when you understand resurfacing ghosts of the past, talking all the time about stuff that has happened to you, however dreadful it is, it just puts you mentally back in that place. And that's all you do. You waste your present moments trying to remember about something that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, as opposed to where am I now? What, what's going on now? What's happening? And it doesn't mean that's not to negate what somebody's gone through, but I just refuse to let them stay there. And people that are hell bent on staying there, and some people are, I can't help them. And I tell them, look, I can't help you because you're not at a point where you're wanting to move forward. And that's okay. That's just where you're at right now. But it's reminding people that the only places you ever really suffer with regards to trauma and things is your memory and your imagination. And oftentimes, as one of the Buddhas said, there is nothing more dangerous than an unguarded thought because all you do is just <laughs> literally go round and round and round in circles with the stuff, the same stuff over and over and over again, rather than progress. It's such a unique angle that you took on the inside the cinematic mind. I just love that, <laughs> what you did there, because I do a little work in entertainment. I love how you almost take that character deeper than what the screenwriter intended. I appreciate <laughs> so that. So what got you started on doing that? And I mean, that's got to be fun, too. <laughs> It certainly can be. I have to confess, we've just finished doing a series on James Bond and it's Daniel Craig's portrayal of James Bond because he took the character, you see this right from the very first film in Casino Royale, he took it far deeper, I think, than any other portrayal of Bond ever had done. And so to answer your question before I, I completely go elsewhere, my wife and I were sitting there one day and she said, oh, there's a new YouTuber that's out and he's really popular and everything. Will you watch him with me? And I'm like, well, what's he about? And he analyzes, he's a meteorologist, and he analyzes storms and disasters in films and how realistically it could be and how realistic they are and, and everything else. That, and it's quite entertaining. So I sat and watched this with her and uh, I sat and the immediate thought in my mind was, I could do this from a psychological perspective because we just finished watching Good Will Hunting with Robin Williams and Matt Damon from, I forget, 97, 99, whatever year it was. And I thought I could do this. And all these characters then started coming to mind of who you could who you could review and talk about and everything. And like the Joker and, and his psychological perspective. And when you really get into it um, and the same with Daniel Craig and, and Patch Adams uh, and uh, Robin Williams and, and so many others. So it really appealed to me. And then you realize the bulk of work that's there as well. Um, but it, it is I mean, it is tremendous fun. And when you can also put out great clips and you can, you know, pull it apart, basically, and, and say, look, when Bond lost Vespa Lane in this moment, well, you're telling the story from a pers perspective of an orphan who has been, who's had the humanity trained out of him uh, by governmental services and how he's functioning, how he's thinking, how he's feeling. And for the first time, because this happened with the Joker, you really understand why they do what they do now it doesn't excuse their behavior 
But when you understand what a person does and why they do it, I think paints them in a very different light. And the Joker, I th- still to this day, we, we analyzed Nicholson, we analyzed Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Heath Ledger and the animated version of the Joker, which tells the probably more than the original story of how he lost his mind, basically, how he became the person <laughs> that he did. It was fascinating from so many different angles, for sure. Your radio program, that's a big get with the LA Tribune. So tell me about how that came about. It's not something I'm doing currently. We've kind of gone our own directions right now, which is fine. But there was, when I was out in the United States in 20, I was doing a tour, the first tour I ever did with my business. And a lady called Anna Renault, who is sadly no longer with us, she was an author and she did a lot of public speaking. She was a cancer survivor, just phenomenal, phenomenal lady. She hosted me and her family and everything. And it really was just through meeting all these different people that we started doing this. So I got in touch with the, I think, chief executives at the LA Tribune. And she was just like, oh, wow, you know, this would be really great. And she came back and said, would you be interested in doing your own show with the LA Tribune? And I was like, yeah, sure. What well, you know, what, what does it involve? And it was like, basically, you take your show that you're doing over here with the Mind, Body and Soul podcast. And let's put it on Roku TV. Let's put it on the network. Let's stream it live. Let's do this, that, and the other. We're looking at doing some major things. And they had a sort of a big event that was coming up. And Bob Proctor was going to be there. And Les Brown was going to be there. And several other, should I say, prominent speakers. They said, would you be interested in speaking as well? All about how marketing has developed, how the psychology of money basically has developed. And I thought, oh, this would be a really good topic. So that's over on our YouTube channel, um, should people wish to see that show. But, you know, I went back uh, after that as an independent podcast host, and I was still very well connected in the world of wrestling, in the world of MMA, in the world of uh, TV, media, etc. So I was able to find a lot of people. And through that, we actually created uh, Teen Life Coaching, which is something that's going to be rolling out in the United States very soon. So there was all sorts of good things that, that came from it afterwards. What would you wish you could change in the world? <laughs> that's a very broad topic. Right? <laughs> I think that there are a number of different answers that I could say, but the one that came to me immediately was for people to realize their own potential. And I'm not saying this as, you know, one of the the Nambi Pambi life coaches or anything like that. I mean, genuinely to realize in yourself that you are responsible, whether you succeed in life or whether you completely screw it up, more often than not, you are responsible for it. It's by your choices, regardless of whatever's happened to you. And this is coming from a guy who came back from the United States, was made homeless, went through all sorts of betrayals and difficulties and struggles, and literally had to rebuild his life over and over and over again. So I can say these things. But literally, I I think recognizing that, but also realizing that the media is not somewhere that you necessarily want to be placing your attention. Because a lot of the time, I genuinely wonder how much truth is there. And I think too many people get so clouded and so caught up by, well, the media says this and Andrew Tate says that and -and so-and-so says this and -and so-and-so says that and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, if it doesn't bring you peace and you're getting yourself in such a tizzy about it, why are you spending your time listening to all of this and and going on? I think that's probably one of the things that immediately, uh, but again, you could say political parties, the media, a lot of stuff on TV, how things are being conditioned, on and on and on. I mean, it's crazy the amount of (laughs) Things of that stuff. Focus that on the household, right? Focus on your family, focus on your friends. Yeah, I, th- I think look, most of all, actually, focus on yourself. And I don't mean to say that as, as being very selfish. I was talking to a friend of mine about this last night that said, oh, you know what, well, well, I only focus on other people. And I'm like, well, who takes care of you? And it stumped him because he was just like, oh, I don't know. And this is someone that's had a history of burnout and a history of depression. And I said, just out of interest, when you were at your most depressed, how burnt out were you? And obviously the answer was very. <laughs> I was like, well, that makes sense. Because if you don't take care of you, A, no one else is going to. But B, you can't take care of anybody else. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. That's a great way to end this broadcast. Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. 
Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.